All right, everybody, welcome to our ECG of the week. And uh, this is our EKG that we're going to go over. So we'll start off by doing what we always do. We're just going to kind of get a general sense of things. We're going to look at the forest or the trees, which are these QRSs, and we'll look at lead two in the rhythm strip when we see a nice, narrow, regular rhythm. We'll find a QRS that is kind of right on the solid line, and we'll count the rate as 300, 150, 100, 75, maybe a little under 75, maybe 72 beats per minute. And so let's take a look and we'll see. Okay, it's pretty narrow, it's pretty regular, so we'll take a look at, see what the atria is doing. So. We'll go up to lead one. We'll look at our P waves. We've got P waves that appear to be occurring throughout, and our P waves are up in lead one. They're up in AVF, and so if they're going towards lead one and towards AVF, we know it's going to be somewhere in this axis for our P waves that are going down to the left, and so we can say that this is a sinus rhythm okay so the next uh, piece of cardiac conduction that we need to evaluate after our atria depolarizes is our ventricle or our AV node excuse me so our AV node is our PR interval and so we'll look at say lead two right here we see our P wave start of our QRS and that looks less than 200 milliseconds or less than five small boxes. And it looks to be the same throughout all the beats. And so we can see our AV node is functioning well. And uh, now let's take a look at our QRS. And so our QRS is narrow. But as you can see, that QRS axis is negative in lead one, and it's positive in AVF. So my QRS is going down and to the right. So it's going away from the lateral leads, but towards the inferior leads. So this is some right axis deviation. So when I see right axis deviation, I should say, well, what causes can cause a right axis deviation? Common causes might be right ventricular hypertrophy, right bundle branch block, anything that causes right heart strain, um, or just could just be anatomy, it could be situs inversus um, with dextrocardia, which is when the heart's on the right side. But let's take a look at our common causes. And so let's evaluate for right ventricular hypertrophy. And, and as you can see, what typically we see what we call R wave progression. So R wave progression. And that's where the R wave typically is smallest in V1. And as we go throughout our precordial leads, the R wave should grow. But as we can see here, that's not the case. We actually have these really tall R waves. And so if I measure this R wave in V1, I see it starts at a baseline here to there. So we've got, say, 5, 10, maybe 14 millimeters R wave in V1. So that would qualify this person with right ventricular hypertrophy. Right ventricular hypertrophy criteria is an R wave 
in V1 greater than seven millimeters. And also if you take a look at the QRS in this lead, you can see almost, almost kind of an RSR prime. I'll zoom in. You can almost see it as RSR prime. However, the QRS duration is narrow, so we know this is not a right bundle branch block. But rather, we could say maybe it's in incomplete. But otherwise, we definitely know we've confirmed our ventricular hypertrophy, perhaps an incomplete right bundle branch block. Okay. And some common things that we see in our RVH, we see a uh, what we would call a right-sided strain pattern, which is the S1, Q3, T3. All that's showing is, is the S wave in lead one. So if I go to lead one, we've got this deep S wave in lead one. And remember, lead one is going toward the left. So if we have deep S waves, we're getting a lot of energy going towards the right, which would make sense if our right ventricle was hypertrophied or strained or working harder. We've got an initial Q wave in lead three. Okay, and, and that makes sense that we also see some forces going towards that right side in our lead three, but also we get this T wave in lead three that is typically inverted, as well as the leads on the precordium that measure the right ventricle, which are kind of V1, V2, and somewhat V3. We'll get some T wave abnormalities in these leads. And that makes sense as we, you know, if I come and look at our distribution of our precordial leads, you'll notice that any depolarization of the right ventricle will be sending signals that are captured, you know, typically by V1 and V2, somewhat V3. And they'll be captured in a negative sense. If I go to our limb leads, negatively captured by our lateral leads, specifically lead one. And so otherwise, this person, um, the clinical picture here, which was interesting, is um, this was from a 21-year-old male with progressive shortness of breath over weeks to months. And his diagnosis was pulmonary hypertension, which will make sense. We have pulmonary hypertension. We have an increased afterload of the right ventricle as the right ventricle is pushing against all this pressure. So over time, the right ventricle is going to hypertrophy to get stronger to push against that. And ultimately, there will be some level of heart failure and thus this progressive shortness of breath that this individual is having. There are many causes of pulmonary hypertension. So I'm not gonna get into that here, but it's interesting to understand kind of the clinical context um, of which we are evaluating EKGs. So ultimately for this individual, we've got our sinus rhythm with right ventricular hypertrophy.